Welcome to Brilliant Mind of Stanford and Silicon Valley. Today we will talk about tech and innovation, mobile, venture investment, but also women in tech. I'm very delighted to welcome a special guest, venture capitalist, Asimo Ati. Hello. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I think that we would start with a very traditional question about the Silicon Valley. Everybody talks about Silicon Valley. Everybody understands that it's not just a place on the map, some region. It's a unique and amazing ecosystem that attracts best tech talent and entrepreneurship talent from all over the world. So what is Silicon Valley for you? And what is so special about Silicon Valley? Yes, I will tell you when I uh, came here uh, 17 years ago, Actually, 19 years ago was my first trip, and I flew from Paris, where I grew up, and I arrived here, and I thought, oh, this is planet Mars. People are completely different from me. Um, I have really nothing in common with them. So I'm here, and I'm going to enjoy my time, and then I'll be gone. And then after a few days on my flight back, I thought, that's exactly why I want to come here. <laughs> and, and a year later, I moved. And I've been here ever since. So it's a place that um, is, I think, completely unique uh, in this planet where you can completely reinvent yourself. You can create your own destiny, your own reality. Um, it has rules, of course, like, like every place, but um, when it's very open. So openness, that's, that's your word for Silicon Valley? I would say that's one of the words. Um, it's forward thinking uh, in many, many ways. And it's uh, backward thinking and traditional in many others. Uh, everybody has heard you yeah. were talking about women in tech, about the Me Too movement. So Silicon Valley is incredibly traditional this way. But it's also extremely forward thinking. If you look at uh, any street in San Francisco, any um, innovation um, out here uh, in, in Palo Alto or, or on Stanford campus, you're probably looking at the, the, the city of the future 10 years from now. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you just told us that you moved here from, from Paris. Mm -hmm. Like, tell us a story how a downtown Parisian girl become a genius of a mobile apps and a VC. A lot of people call you a genius of a mobile apps. <laughs> yes, thank you. That, that, that's nice. Um, so, you know, I grew up, I, I became an engineer. I was uh, inspired by my grandfather, who was a, an engineer as well. Um, and I, I never really thought of um, myself as a, as a woman. I was just, you know, very talented in, in math, and, and why not just, you know, do what I'm, what I'm good at. So I became one of the, you know, 12% women in, in, um, in engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, but really, I never was a very good engineer. <laughs> so I realized I was more interested in business uh, very early on. And, uh, and so I moved here to get my MBA uh, on campus at Stanford. And that was a big transformational moment. For two years I was here on this campus. I had the time to, to learn, to explore, discover this new country, uh, and think about what I wanted to do. And I then, when I graduated, spent a dozen years building products and companies. Um, I worked for large companies like Nokia and Electronic Arts. Uh, small companies, uh, including my own, uh, a few times. After I sold my last company, I spent a few years at Facebook. It was a very interesting time to, to be there. Um, and, and after I left Facebook, I uh, started investing. And uh, the, the particular angle uh, that I, I took with investing is, um, is my expertise as an operator, which is product. I, I left Facebook because I was invited to write a book on what makes a great product. And as I was writing this book, I realized that every one of my peers at the time, uh, VP product, heads of product, had an interesting perspective to share on what makes a great product. Big question. And so I started this network, which over the past four or five years has become one of the largest networks of product managers in the world. Uh, there's about 200,000 product managers who consume our videos, our podcasts, our articles. If you have you know, people I I listening to, to this interview who want to build great products, I encourage them to go to our website, productsthatcount.com. 
But long story short, a lot of people building products were coming to me saying, I see, like, why don't you invest in my company? And we got so much deal flow, my partners and I, that we spun out a venture capital firm. And that's Mighty Capital. And the way we're trying to do venture capital is we're trying to reinvent the industry. So we've been quoted as a new way of doing venture capital because what we do is we bring a lot of value to our portfolio companies by giving them access to that network of 200,000 product managers. So it's way more than money. Yeah, so look, what was primarily the reason for you when you were creating this network? It's just to meet the people like you, to share your knowledge, or you know, like to receive something from them? Yeah, so you know, when it started, it was really realizing, oh, there's a big question out there, what makes a great product that nobody really started answering. And so I started, you know, inviting my peers and we had dinner parties talking about what makes a great product. It's very popular in Silicon Valley two years ago when blockchain was, you know, Bitcoin was trading at you know twenty thousand dollars, they were blockchain dinner parties, right? So it's it's not an uncommon thing to do. <clears throat> uh, but what happened is really it took off. So these people started to say, Well, I have teams, so why don't I give a talk and then in front of the the more junior people who are going to learn, and then that was in San Francisco, but then some of them started moving to New York. So they said, I'm going to run this chapter in New York. And then some of them said, oh, well, I'm in Chicago, maybe there's not enough critical mass to run a chapter in Chicago, but I'll host a podcast so I can you know, become virtual. And then other people uh, in Taiwan, in the Ukraine, in South Africa, everywhere around the world started offering their help. Uh, to help define, you know, what makes a great product, and for me it was just really, um, it's it's magical. I mean, that's part of the beauty of Silicon Valley, which is you can just reinvent, you know, yourself, reinvent everything. Yeah. So, have you ever thought that you, your small initiative would turn out in such a big moment? Of course. <laughs> that's a Silicon Valley again. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, and you know, they were probably like three, four other ideas that I was pursuing at the time as hobbies, as possible businesses, on my own, with others. Uh, one of the things that you find in Silicon Valley that can be a great thing, but it is, can, can also be a weakness, is people experiment a lot. Right? So you, you do a lot of experimentation, and then at some point, and, and that's, that's an important point, at some point you have to make a commitment. So what you'll find in Silicon Valley is the, the culture of experimentation is fantastic, but you have people sometimes who just relish in that culture, and so they you know they job hop every six months. Uh, there's not a lot of loyalty, and, and that that's when it gets to be a, a negative quality. So the culture of experimentation is awesome, but then at some point you have to take something and run with it. Yeah. So you know you came here long time ago, but how would you describe the state of the Silicon Valley at the moment? And, wh and what is the future of Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where do you see the Silicon Valley is heading? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, very great and unique things about Silicon Valley, and it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, it's hard to come here, it's hard to survive here. Um, so if you make it here, uh, you have a chance at building something really meaningful because you have a lot of resilience, you have a lot of persistence um, and ambitions. Uh, so Silicon Valley, because of that, is still attracting the best talent and it's not going away anytime soon. But there are many uh, other cities that are trying to replicate Silicon Valley and right now uh, my eyes are on New York. Uh, and, uh, and I'm realizing that what's happening in New York right now is um, pretty much what was happening in Silicon Valley, I would say, 10 years ago. There's a very strong combination of innovation, investments, great universities, um, enthusiasm, talent that's knowledgeable yet eager. And, and there's a lot of the positive aspect of that culture of experimentation that's developing and less of the negative aspects. So you're asking, like, what's going to happen in Silicon Valley in the long term, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think it's going to have to, you know, be maybe a little less spoiled. Let's now talk about the tech trends. You know, like what top five 
tech trends you see now in Silicon Valley as a VC? And where are you investing at the moment? Mm -hmm. I'll give you two, not five. Okay. <laughs> I'm two, trying to stay focused. Yeah. Uh, mobile and genomics. And I'll explain. So mobile is basically everything that can be invented that's valuable, right? Value-add services on top of the mobile body of data. And the mobile body of data is all the data that our mobile phones are collecting. So everything that's outside of us, our context, our location, our friends, our calendar, our health. And then uh, all these services using you know, AI technology, big data, and, and all of that are, are value-add services that are still being invented, right? The, the, the tip of the iceberg was Facebook and Airbnb and Uber, but now we're going deeper into the enterprise, we're going into like industrial energy. So there's, there's a huge amount of innovation that's going to come from that you know, mobile uh, data. And now like, you take the same services and you apply them on top of a different data set, the genomics body of data, which is inside of us. Right? It's like all the stuff that make us human. And you apply that same technology, the same AI, the same big data, the same what, what have you, uh, on top of this body of data, and you have a whole new set of services. And so that's, that's where my eyes are. So what are then future technologies that you see potentially coming in the next 10 years? Oh yeah, so in the next 10 years, in addition to mobile yeah. and genomics, which I think are going to still be very active in 10 years, I see another body of data, which is a blockchain body of data. And uh, we made our first investment in the blockchain recently to really try and understand what's there, how is this going to, to materialize. There's the opportunity to really reinvent all of technology through the blockchain. So, you know, mobile is our environment, the, the real yeah. life. Genomics is us human. Uh, blockchain is reinventing technology. What about biotech? It's close to genomics, potentially. You know, if you look at the broader scope? Yeah, biotech is a very interesting field. I will tell you the cycles of biotech innovation are so long that in venture capital, it's not necessarily an industry that makes sense. It's an industry that may make sense for, you know, government grants or um, maybe sort of, you know, passion projects or, um, or, or double bottom lines. Uh, but as venture capitalists, we're always looking at a return that's um, within the time frame of you know, most funds, which is seven to ten years. Yeah, let's talk about your hat as a venture capitalist. Uh, my understanding is that for your VC funds to consider investing into startup require the startup to be based in Silicon Valley primarily, or at least in the US. Definitely. So Silicon Valley today and starting next year, we'll be making investments out of New York in addition. But you're right, in the US at the moment. Why you are not looking into other geographics? Because of what we were talking about earlier, which is it's actually hard to come here, survive, build a company, build a life, reinvent yourself. And if you can do that, then you have a, a stronger shot at being successful. If you're, uh, so it means you're more, you're more ambitious and more resilient as, as a person, as a CEO, as a founder. In addition to that, you will have an easier time if you can you know, insert yourself into Silicon Valley to raise money, as opposed to if you come from some other place and you're trying to find investments either locally or in Silicon Valley. So, so once you make the adjustment, your company will have an easier time. Yeah. Let's come back again to your additional hat, which is making mobile products that people love. Like, how do you do that? What is the secret sauce of you know, being called as a genius of mobile apps? Are there any magic or like, there is some algorithm, some scheme you are going with with the same? So this is the interesting thing I learned um, building products for a dozen years mobile product, but now everything is mobile, right? Yeah. So it's almost like a, an oxymoron. Uh, this is the interesting thing I learned. All of our technology is an extension of ourselves, right? Our cell phone, smart watches, smart glasses, smart clothing, it's an extension of ourselves. And so when we think what makes a great mo product, great mobile product or great product really, we have to think, 
what makes a great person? Because the extension of a person, right, is still a person. So if you think about it, there aren't too many frameworks that describe a good person. Right? If I ask you, yeah. like, tell me what's a good person, well, the one that I found the most relevant, and that's how you know that I'm in California, <laughs> is the mind-body-spirit framework. <laughs> and so, you know, I looked at this and I said, okay, so as a person, the body rule, we all want to look good. Well, we are going to expect that our technology is also going to be beautiful. It's way more than the pretty pictures, right? Yeah. It's about efficiency, it's about wow. Then the spirit rule, we all want to have a meaningful life. Well, we expect that our technology is also going to be personalized, right? Yeah. But that comes with respect for our privacy. And then finally, the mind rule, right? Body, spirit, mind. mind. We all want to learn. We all want to grow. The people who are listening to this interview, everybody. And we expect that our technology is also going to learn and grow and adapt with us. And if you follow these three rules, then you build a great product, right? Product that's beautiful uh, at, at many, many different levels product that's personalized but respects your privacy is very meaningful and then products that learns and grow as as you use them well sounds simple from one side but from the other side if you think about philosophy behind that there are a lot of issues to consider and i really like the term that you use it's productized it's amazing yeah and that's kind so, of and the secret to that and you, i love that you mentioned philosophy is that on all these three aspects, right, it's both an art and a science. And if you use just the art part, right, then you're going to be all creative, but, but you won't see the results, you won't measure the results of your work, so you won't be able to improve them. But if you focus only on the scientific part, which Silicon Valley is, I think, a little too much um, <laughs> about, uh, about, then you, you, you sort of get diminishing returns, right? You just optimize as opposed to reinvent. And so the secret is really on these three aspects, the, the body, the spirit, the mind, to alternate a more of a creative approach and a scientific approach and go back and forth. Well, let's talk about this mobile revolution, the mobile revolution that we are seeing, and it effect on a business, not technology business, actually. Like, how, like what is the phenomenon? And like, is there any test? that every business could go, whether it will survive this mobile revolution? Or how do the business adapt? Or are there any you know, advice from you? Well, I will say that if you're not a mobile business by now, you're on your way to being out of business, right? <laughs> like five years ago, uh, that was already a big discussion. Nokia, Kodak, yeah. Yahoo, which other incredibly innovative and forward-thinking company can we mention that has not failed if, you know, if they failed at their mobile transition? I'll tell you a story of the time that I was at Facebook. Um, so that was you know, uh, already five, six years ago when Facebook became public. And if you remember, a lot of the news was, oh, Facebook is going to die because yes. it's not becoming a mobile company. And I will tell you from the inside, it was true. Facebook was not a mobile company and it was not willing to become a mobile company. And in fact, one of the core values of the company was move fast and break things. And if you break things on mobile, as all of us know, uh, you're going to stop using your app, you're going to leave a bad review, you're going to maybe delete it. So it's not like a website where if you stop using it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You cannot leave a review. You cannot really delete it, right? On mobile, like, when you have a bad product, it really sticks with you. And so Facebook was really not getting this. It was saying, like, move fast, break things, we don't mm -hmm. care. But then it realized that, okay, if I want to be successful with mobile, I need to really change not only my technology, but also my culture. And so it changed its core value to be a just about moving fast, and it created a whole mobile organization and it made it a priority. Um, for Facebook, it was really a matter of survival at that time and Facebook is one of the most innovative businesses for uh, you know, a more traditional company, whether it's in energy or, or fishing or manufacturing or even professional services, uh, the time is now or maybe even yesterday. Yeah. Do they still have a time to catch up? So. Uh, 
there are different ways to catch up. Right? You can catch up by hiring people who understand yes. mobile. Um, you can catch up that by making acquisitions of companies that um, are mobile first. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the second one, you, you have to be able to afford it. Very few people can buy their way into mobile. So then you have to hire your way into mobile. And, and the challenge here is that it comes with a cultural change every time. I'll give you an example. I already talked about Facebook was too much of a risk taker and needed to become a little bit more conservative, like do not break things anymore, right? Yeah. Just move fast. Now I'll take the example of say Mercedes, the car company. Well, I'm not privy to Mercedes strategy, but I would imagine with the rise of Uber and Lyft and car sharing companies, that it's moving more towards a culture of car as a service. And so it's going to need to take more risk than it used to. Right? If you ship a Mercedes and it has a problem, you're in yeah. big trouble. But if you ship a service that leases a Mercedes, well, you can always update it. Right? So the entire culture of the company needs to shift to be less risk adverse. Facebook, more risk adverse. So really the employees also have to reinvent themselves. And, and change not just the culture, but, but who they are, what they do, how many risks they take, how they think about their work. So it's not about technology, actually. It's about changing your it's culture, about culture of your company. It's about culture of a company and who you are as an employee. Because you know everybody who starts to work today is going to have a dozen different jobs. And so today, of course, our workforce is mobile first, mobile native. Um, but in three years, five years, something else will come and they're going to have to reinvent themselves. And the companies they work for is also going to have to change you know, their culture, adapt to new trends. So if they want to continue to have a job and be current, they will have to adapt also to the new cultures of the company. So the skill really that I think is going to be most important for the next 10, 20 years is the skill of reinventing yourself. Yeah, we talked a bit about reinventing the company, reinventing the culture. Let's talk now about reinventing yourself as a person, as a professional, as the tech engineer or as a product manager. I really like, you know, in one of your blog, you told that you reinvented yourself. And in order to do that, you viewed yourself as a product. Mm -hmm. And like, walk us through this process. Yes, you know, how, how being product manager actually helped yourself to transition from being a C-suite person to becoming, you know, a venture capitalist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think of uh, reinvention as a very, very simple skill. You have to do it every three to five years. So you do, you know, first gap analysis, right? Product like, I'm here, I want to go there, what am I missing? And and once you identify your target, right, what you're missing, so I'll, I'll take a very simple example. Hey, I'm an engineer, I want to become a product manager. Well, I need to, for example, learn to, be, to build good products, right? So I need to become a part of the product conversation. And there's three different levels that you're a part of this conversation. The first level is 101, right? Yeah. I want to join the product conversation. Second level, I want to shape the product conversation. And third, I want to drive the product conversation. So how did I do that? Well, join my, I'm very big in New Year resolutions. My resolution at the time was, I'm going to tweet one interesting article on product uh, every day. Well, it seems very simple, yeah. and Twitter, LinkedIn, it doesn't matter, I, even if you don't tweet, just find an interesting article once a day. It's actually really difficult. You have to read a lot of bad articles yeah. before you find a good one, right? And all of a sudden, as you do that, with that discipline and regularity, you're going to become very educated right. at that field, right? So the product conversation in that case. So all of a sudden, you may become a subject matter expert, and you're going to have a perspective on the product conversation, which is you're going to start shaping it, right? So, oh, this article was really interesting, but the author forgot to mention this really important aspect. Or, you know, I don't agree necessarily with their perspective on the second point, but the third point, I didn't thought about, I hadn't thought about it, and it's brilliant. So, all of a sudden, you're going to shape the conversation. 
my New Year resolution, uh, like I said, I'm big into this, when I, when I decided I want to shape was I want to be on one panel each month. And so I would go to a lot of events and I would go reach out to the conference organizer and I would say, hey, do you need somebody like me on your panel? Do you need an immigrant? Do you need somebody who's been at Facebook? Do you need a woman? Do you need a technology expert? It didn't matter. I just want to be on a panel so that I can shape the conversation and give my perspective on a topic that's given to me. Yeah, but that's again a commitment from your side because it's a you, huge are, commitment. you are again you're preparing to the panel and you're investing a lot of time and you're acquiring additional knowledge. Exactly, and then you're raising your visibility as a subject matter expert. And the more you do that, the more you realize like, oh, so actually the key topics that matter in the product conversation these days are Not one, two, three. And then you start actually driving the conversation where you say, for example, well, I believe that we should really be talking about privacy because so much of our products now is about personalization. If we don't protect our data, yeah. we're going to fail, right? So all of a sudden you're driving the conversation and that's when you start, you know, writing books, giving keynotes, um, and being a very visible person that's a thought leader in that industry. So if you think about you know, that trajectory, like I'm an engineer and I'm just educating myself by you know, tweeting one article every day for a year, and then I'm sort of raising my profile, right, by speaking once a month on a panel, and now I'm saying like, these are the three topics that matter in our industry. All of a sudden you've really transformed yourself because you join shape, drive the conversation. Wow, it's amazing. Again, but you know, the same as for your philosophy of product ties. It sounds simple, but it just requires commitment, persistence, exactly, and resilience. It's, it's a, so much about discipline. And I think so much of, you know, being here in Silicon Valley is having that discipline of never giving up, trying many things, committing when it's the right time, and, and knowing how to um, never give up. Oh. Let's talk now about women in tech. Unfortunately, notwithstanding all this women empowerment movement, what we see even in Silicon Valley, I can say that the same situation is in Ukraine. We still do not see you know, as many women and the top C-level of the corporations or VC funds or as successful founders. There are trends that we see more, but still not so many. And you know, when you spoke to young women at one of your events that you committed to be, you told them to stop listening to any role and start making their own role. Do you think that's the biggest problem or are there some others? Um, I think that's a critical um, success um, advice uh, for young women. Uh, when I speak with them, what I hear all the time is, I want to be X, I want to be a product manager, I want to be an investor, I want to be anything, but I don't have like technical skills. I don't have connections. I'm, you know, I'm basically seeing an obstacle in front of me. And so my my answer to them is, well, who who ever said that it was necessary to overcome this obstacle, right, in order to become what you want to be? So who ever said that to be a great product manager, you need to have a technical background? There are plenty of examples of technical of product managers that don't have a technical background. So people are giving you that concern like, oh, you don't have a technical background, so I won't give you the job. Well, go take a web development class and then you check the box, yeah. right? Remove the barriers. Just and then in your it's, head. it's in your head. And then if somebody challenges you, like who are they to challenge you? You say you're an expert, they say you aren't. Are they an expert at who's an expert? They aren't, not any more than you are an expert. So start calling yourself what you want to be before you are that and that's how you become. I'll tell you an example. When, uh, when I published my book, I updated my LinkedIn and I put on my title, Technology Visionary. Oh. And, and for six months, I was so uncomfortable with that headline. Oh. But I looked at other authors, men mostly, and that's what they said. So I said, 
I'm going to do the same. And one day, uh, a friend of mine calls me and says, I am so proud of you for putting this on your LinkedIn. And it was so fun because I called myself this, was I a visionary? Was I not a visionary? I don't know. But I just said, this is who I am. And I encourage every woman to, to do exactly the same. Just put it out there. This is who you are and this is then how you be, who you become. That's one key advice. The other thing that I will say is um, I rarely talk about diversity. In fact, I try to avoid talking about diversity because if I did, that's all I would do instead of doing my job. Um, but I do uh, think inclusion is important. And inclusion comes from having... Um, from having fair and clear rules of engagement. So I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. Right now, that I, I teach a class at Stanford on being a good board member on governance. And a lot of people come to me and say, well, women on board, it's a problem, there aren't enough. Would you talk about that? So what I say is I, I certainly would, but I will not give statistics on how there are not enough women because everybody knows them, it's infuriating and it doesn't change anything. But what I can do is I can give best practices for effective governance. Because if we have a well-functioning boardroom, then we can welcome anybody from any background. Then it means we, are, we have an inclusive boardroom with not only you know, different genders, but different skill sets, different ethnicities, different value add, different level of um, expertise and business uh, acumen and then we have a very functioning board which creates more effective and more successful companies so I think the diversity topic uh, as you know frustrating as it can be uh, needs to be reframed to be a topic about inclusion and governance and rules of engagement so that everybody can participate and have a say so it's again about culture rather than it's just about culture changing the culture and creating the environment that would encourage women to join. Correct. It's about culture, says the engineer, <laughs> the scientific. It's all about yeah. culture and people interaction. But you're not an engineer, you're now tech visionary, remember <laughs> that? <Thank> you. <laughs> no. And one more question related to women, actually, in business, not only in tech. How do you balance your professional life and your, actually, like, mind, body, and spirit thing? Yes, I don't. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, I, actually, I don't and I do. Uh, because right now, at this stage in our business growth, I am still the, um, the, the critical factor in the growth of the organization. I'm working on removing that, but if, if I'm a point of failure, then it means I cannot afford to fail. So my, you know, what I eat, how I sleep, <laughs> How much I exercise is really critical to the business, and so it's become even more important to me. But I don't know of anybody who's had any level of success who had, you know, a, a harmonious work-life yeah. balance, and and I don't think that's uh, that's possible. If you look at yourself as a potentially investing in the success of organization, and if you consider actually your kind of a personal life and your mind, body, and spirit, as also the contribution to the success, will it help you to invest more in your, you know, personal development? Oh, you're absolutely right. Like, you're, you're asking, is it worth it to invest in yourself? A hundred percent all the time. And that's part of that culture of reinvention, right? If, if I don't reinvent myself, or if I don't think that I'm going to need to reinvent myself every three years, then I don't really need to invest in myself. But since I know every three years I'm going to be a new person, have a new career, do something different, then all, all this is about is about learning and growing. I'll share something else with you. In, in my organization, every new person we hire gets one book that I call, that, that's called The Growth Mindset. And The Growth Mindset, you may be familiar with it, is a book that says when you're making a mistake, it's not a mistake, it's a learning opportunity. Uh, so, in, uh, in our staff meeting, every week, we have a, our growth mindset moment, where basically we share like a mistake we made, but now everybody is like so excited to yeah. share mistakes because they're like, oh, this is what I learned, <laughs> as opposed to, oh, this is the mistake I made. Yeah. And it completely transformed the organization because now we're experimenting, we're trying, 
and we're learning and we're sharing these learnings so other people don't make the same mistakes. Wow, that's amazing. And now we are coming to our traditional part of an interview where just short answer questions. Okay. The first one, what is Ukraine in one sentence for you? I'll say a couple of things. Um, so historically, uh, I, I studied Russian and, and Russian culture. I will say Ukraine is the birthplace of Russia, Kiev. Uh, now, looking forward, uh, we actually um, have a development team that's based in the Ukraine. Uh, I've been there, I've spoken at tech conferences there. So I think Ukraine has a tremendous potential to build great technology. What it's missing today is a product mindset. So it knows how to build something great, but it doesn't know what to build. Right? Once it's given something to build, does it really well, but doesn't necessarily know how to invent that product. Therefore, we're having you for this interview today. What are you reading right now? I'm, I'm reading a, a really interesting 800-page economic <laughs> book called The Commanding Heights, which describes the different cycles of uh, balance of power between government and private sector. Yeah. And it basically says every 40 years or so, there's a change in that balance of power. And I think right now we're in the midst of one of these changes where it was all about private enterprise for the past 40 years and government is trying to take more power back. Wow, that's amazing. Best piece of advice you've ever been given? Best piece of adla advice for my life was when I was in my early 20s, just before I moved here. My aunt, who was a very uh, ambitious, pioneering uh, businesswoman, said, you know, if I was your age, I would get an, an experience abroad. <laughs> Look where I am now, after yeah. 20 years. Uh, if you could pitch to one person, who would it be? So I, I would, I would um, if I had a new idea today, where, where would I look for it? I would look for it in uh, space exploration. In fact, when I was in the Ukraine, I went to um, Ruskosmos, uh, to Dnipro, uh, and loved you know all the history of that place. Uh, but if I had today to choose a career, I think I would choose uh, in in the space exploration uh, industry. Well, your perfect day looks like looks like a day without uh, an emergency. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me.